This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. We're looking at question four of the December 2013 paper F9 exam. So make sure you've got the question in front of you. And looking quickly at the requirements, part A, evaluate whether Spot should use leasing or borrowing as a source of finance, explaining the ma method which you use. That's very conventional. Lease buy is a standard topic. Usually it's regarded as the MPV question. Um, and here he has kept it much, much easier than what you should have been used to because he says ignore tax and tax does make extra work. That here is the only calculation bit, so 10 marks arithmetic. The other three bits are completely independent um, and are all discussion. B, discuss the attractions of leasing as a source of short-term and long-term finance. It's a fairly conventional textbook question. Uh, part C, a little bit about Islamic finance, the concept of reburn, how returns are made. So again, completely separate and very, very textbook. And part D, discuss the reasons why interest rates may differ between loans of different maturity. Again, standard textbook. Um, it's really about the yield curve. And each of those, five marks each, so it's not wanting too much for each of them. Anyway, I'll go through it in order. Let's do part A first of all. Um, part A you could in fact do in two ways. I'll do it first of all what you might call the standard way, the normal textbook way, which you should really have learnt, um, which is to set up the cash flows under each of the two alternatives, lease and buy, uh, discount, and see which is the cheaper. So that's what I'll do first. Uh, option one, which is leasing. Um, it lasts for five years, but we're making a lease payment of 155,000 a year. So the lease payments, because we're paying at the start of each year, the first payment would be now, time zero. That would cover us for the first year. In a year's time, we pay another 155, which will cover us for the second year. Time two for the third year. Time three, the start of the fourth year. And time four, the start of the fifth year. So we're making five payments, but the, because it's in advance, it's zero, one, two, three, four. I'll leave a space because I'll need to do some discounting shortly, but option two is buying it. If we buy it, um, we'll pay out the cost of 750000 now. We'll get scrap of 10%. 75,000 at the end of its life, which is at time five. And we'll pay maintenance of, what is it, 20,000 a year. Uh, and we'll assume, as always, that these payments are ends of years. So time one, time two, time three, time four, time five. And so the net cash flows, if we buy it, 750,000 at time zero, an outflow of 20 at time one, and at time two, and at time three, and at time four, and at time five, a net inflow of 55,000. We need to see which is the cheapest option. Uh, we know that um, borrowing it and buying it, I beg your pardon, would mean borrowing at 7% a year to see whether leasing is effectively costing more or less. We'll discount both at 7% a year. Standardly, the after-tax cost of borrowing. No tax here, so 7%. So what are the discount factors? Oops, at 7%. Um, for one year, 0.935. 0 0.873, 0 0.816, 0 0.763. And while I'm there, because I'm going to do it for buying as well, let's save a bit of time. 0.873. 
go back to leasing the present values. You better check me here. But even if I do make a silly mistake, I'll get most of the marks because it's clear what I'm trying to do. The odd arithmetic mistakes only going to lose you the odd half mark here and there. And so the total present value, if we lease it, I get six, seven, nine, nine, eight, five. Whereas if we buy it, the present values. Sorry, be patient with me. Ooh, seven, seven, eight, five, two, five. Um, I'm pretty sure my arithmetic is correct. As I said, though, that's only the odd half mark. However, now we can make the decision. Remember, these are costs we want the cheapest. And so in this particular case, leasing is the preferred option. And there we are, accept, do note, it says explain the evaluation method which we've used. Well, I have effectively said it in words, but the method we've used, we've made the decision by effectively determining that the effective cost of leasing is less than the 7% cost of borrowing. Okay, now, the approach I've used is the standard approach. That's the approach you should have learnt. It's the approach all the textbooks use. It's the Normally, it's really the only approach that would make any sense. There is an alternative, but I'm not going to do it in full. I'll explain. We'd have to be slightly careful. I hope I've made it clear that whatever approach we take, the decision really is, is leasing effectively costing more or less than 7%. We know if we buy it, we'll be borrowing 750 at 7%. What you could have done is worked out the effective cost of leasing But what you'd have had to have done is said, well, leasing is like having borrowed 750,000. I said I wouldn't do it, but I probably can. I just don't want to waste too much of your time. If we lease it, I'll set the flows up 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 
it's effectively the same as if we were borrowing 750,000, the original cost. And then we'd have to pay out, like repayments, the lease payments. What was it? 155,000 a year. Remember, it was in advance. We've already discussed that. However, since we're going to compare it with um, uh, borrowing the money, leasing it would save us the maintenance. It would save us, what was it, 20000 a year. And so the net flows a net 595,000 at time 0, 135,000 at time 1, at time 2, at time 3, at time 4, inflow of 20 at time 5. So those are the sorts of the effective cash flows. To check whether uh, it is, the cost is higher or lower than, lease, uh, than buying, you'd have had to work out the internal rate of return. And although I'm not going to do it, you will find it is less than 7%. Now, if you have taken that approach, fine. It's not the standard approach, but um, it would come to the same conclusion. Um, the problem is, well, A, if there had been tax involved, it does get a lot messier, but also um, a lot of people would forget when you're trying to compare the saved maintenance. So if you had taken that approach and done it sort of half right, you would obviously get some credit. Anyway, personally, I feel a bit bad doing that, but I would ignore, or I wouldn't do it that way at all. The standard way is to set up the flows, discount at the after tax cost of borrowing, and see which is the cheaper of the two. However, remember that was 10 marks, there's another 15, and the other 15 very much separate uh, and entirely uh, discussion. And as always, if you've listened to any of the others, although the examiner's answers will inevitably be a lot longer because he always writes more than he expects, I'm not going to write answers out in full. Just let me make the main points that he'd be after. The first is part B. Discuss the attractions of leasing as a source of both short-term and long-term finance. What is The main thing there is that um, a short-term... Uh, what we're really looking at is um, an operating lease where you're effectively uh, renting the asset. And the attraction, of course, is really very much a cash flow uh, side of it. You've got the use of the asset, but you've not got the, the big cash flow and the need to raise um, the finance. So it's a short-term uh, short finance. It's also worth mentioning sale and lease back. Where perhaps you already own the asset, you sell the asset to a leasing company. And then you lease it back. Uh, but with an operating lease, generally, the lessor, the person leasing it to you, is responsible for the repairs and uh, things. You are just renting it for the period. Uh, when we're talking about long-term uh, finance, though, uh, 
we're really talking here about a finance lease. Where you take full responsibility here, you would generally do all the repairs, just as though you owned it, so you're effectively borrowing from the finance company, uh, lease company. Uh, instead of conventional borrowing when you've obviously got your repayments, here it is effectively as though you're borrowing from the lease company as though you're buying the asset and you're making repayments to the lease company. In fact, I'm writing more than I intended. Uh, but certainly, that would get me most, if not all, of the five marks. Uh, C, Islamic finance. Well, you should have read up on this, and there's a lot he could have asked, but here, five marks, he's not wanting much. The main things are, when it comes to Reba, well, the important thing is that under Islamic finance, um, the lender is not allowed to charge interest. You know, there are the requirements about the sorts of assets you can buy, you know, not investing in alcohol or gambling. But that's not really terribly relevant here. They're not allowed to charge interest, REBA. How do you make returns if you can't charge interest? Well, the lender, in several different ways, but you don't need to go into specifics here, but the lender um, is entitled certainly to a share of the profits. from the investment. Uh, that's how they get the return. But they must bear a share of the risk. Now, I've not written much there, but quite frankly, I'll be surprised if the examiner himself writes a lot more. Certainly, that, that's really the bulk, if not all of the five marks. That instead of charging interest and taking no or very little risk, you get your return by getting a share of the profit, but you have to accept some of the risk. Finally, D. Again, I said earlier, very, very much textbook. This is the yield curve. The loans are different maturity. Um, you find, he wouldn't expect you to draw the yield curve. I'm using this as a bit of teaching. But you find if you looked at the uh, interest rates that are charged on loans of different lengths, the interest rates per annum, you know, if you borrow for um, uh, six months, you borrow for a year, you borrow for five years, depending on uh, the length of the borrowing, um, the rates of interest they charge stand to change. We generally say that there's some sort of upward sloping yield curve that, you know, if you're borrowing for five years, maybe the yearly interest rate is greater than if you're borrowing for one year. It's not a rule. In theory, it could be any shape. This is what he's talking about. Why are there different interest rates if you borrow for five years as opposed to if, if you borrow for one year? And as I say, it is textbook. There are really three factors you should have mentioned. Um, if you remember the words, great, but more important is uh, a brief explanation of them. Uh, one is what we call liquidity preference uh, theory. This, this is very much talking about the risk. The longer uh, you borrow or lend money for, uh, the longer you're doing without the money. You want a higher interest to compensate 
for being without the money for a longer period. I said I wouldn't write in full, but I wouldn't exactly have written much more in the exam. Now, but that's one reason. Another reason is what we call expectations theory. What I mean here is currently, I don't know, interest rates may be 10% a year for short-term borrowing. But if, if the lender felt that interest rates were going to go up a lot in the future, they're not going to lend you at a fixed 10% for the next 10 years. If they think interest rates are going to go up and they're charging you a fixed rate, they'll charge you a higher rate. And similarly, if they think rates will go down, maybe they'll charge you lower. But it, this could cause the yield curve, in fact, to fall. But the fixed interest quoted today uh, will, to an extent, depend on the interest rates expected in the future. And finally, another factor that affects it is what we call market segmentation theory. Uh, I said earlier, if you, ha if you didn't remember the words, that doesn't matter too much. More important than the words is the explanation. If you've got the explanation, you can get full marks. If you've got the words, you wouldn't get full marks unless you'd explain them. Uh, but, <coughs> dear, excuse me, what this is getting at is different types of people borrow for different periods. Um, different types of borrowers borrow for different lengths of time uh, for example to try and make it clear what I'm saying I as an individual might be looking at fairly short-term borrowing, one or two years. Uh, governments, though, government borrowing tends to be long-term. They might be borrowing for 10 years. And the relevance of that is that they have, they have different expectations or different requirements. So the rates the lenders can charge the different types of borrowers are likely to be different. They might, uh, the lenders might be able to get away with charging me at quite high rates, even though I'm borrowing short term. Government, they may be forced to give perhaps lower rates. It's not a rule, but it will affect it, and that's what's asked here. Why may the interest rates differ? Well, there are the three standard reasons. Okay.